Hi there, Sharon Arrow here, nutrition coach. And today's topic is, am I addicted to gluten foods, wheat and milk products, especially cheese? Are you considering if maybe you're intolerant to these foods or even addicted? Perhaps you've heard about this, perhaps this is a new concept, but uh, it's real. I've experienced it and my son has from what I could observe and I've had the test for it which showed a small positive but a positive result. I might say a bit more about that later why I only got a slight positive positive. and I have done some research to look into this. If you googled this topic you would find Plenty of articles saying no, it's not a real thing, but you'll also find good articles and good research that says yes, this is a thing and it's a uh, quite a big deal. So let me run through it. I'm going to try and keep this uh, video as a introductory overview summary, but there's a fair amount that goes into understanding this topic. My goal of this is to help you understand if this might be a problem for you and then to know what to do about it, why you would want to find out if this is a problem for you and what you would do to find out and then ongoing. So, firstly thinking of wheat foods, um, which one of the biggest problems with wheat foods is the gluten. Not everybody who reacts to wheat is reacting to the gluten. Uh, but today we're focusing on gluten as an issue, not because of celiac disease. People with celiac disease, like my husband, they legitimately um, have an autoimmune reaction. Their immune system kicks into gear to instantly fight the gluten and in the process damages the lining of their intestines. Celiac is a different issue and a very serious one. And on the intolerances perspective, you can be intolerant to wheat and milk products. And that's again a different issue with different symptoms, which I do react in that way. And the most noticeable one for me is milk products would give me a sore throat, even if I was quite sensitive quite quickly. The other one with milk products that we all know about, I'm sure, is lactose intolerance. And that is a different issue with different symptoms. And you would know if, um, if you have this, I reckon, because I don't suffer from the lactose intolerance to milk proteins. But, I mean, hang on, wait, I messed up. Um, the lactose problem is a reaction to the sugar that's in milk, the milk sugar, the lactose. Um, the other type of reactions are reactions to the milk protein. And so yeah, the lactose reaction to the sugar upsets your gut fairly quickly, you know about it. Definite gut symptoms. The addictive type response is different, again, different to all those. Let me have a sip of water. Well, actually it's not water, it's a weak cold tea. I've got green tea as well as cranberry and pomegranate <laughs> mixed together for a saxo flavour. So the specific addiction mechanism, different to allergy, different to celiac, different to lactose issues and different to even a protein intolerance. It's sad but true that for some people, this is the important part, not everybody, for some people, the, the partially broken down proteins from wheat and other foods that contain other grains that have gluten and wheat's the main one, and milk products, the partially broken down protein under certain circumstances will act like exactly like an opiate in the body not as strong as a dose of heroin but the same kind of thing um, an opiate like morphine 
And even like our body's own natural endorphins, we can produce endorphins and we're supposed to because there are feel good chemicals and all sorts of things can boost our natural endorphins and make us feel good. But causes problems when we get it from wheat or milk. And the reason that cheese is a big one is because cheese is the compact source of protein, especially a hard cheese. Lots of protein compared to yogurt or ice cream or milk. I honestly think, and I'm a Christian, and I think that um, the, the enemy is behind the dark forces of the world. I think that he has had a hand in creating this problem. And the enemy has messed up so many aspects of our diet as well as our whole world. So part of the problem is that milk products and wheat are not how they originally were. That's the story for another video though. Perhaps you know bits and pieces of that. So how does it happen? Number one, the addiction effect, the opiate effect only comes from two conditions. Number one condition, um, not enough enzymes in the gut to completely break down the proteins. So these two proteins, gluten in wheat and in milk products, it's casein protein. Both of those um, are a two-stage process requiring two different enzymes to break them down completely. So quite often, and I think this is genetic, genetic predisposition to not producing enough enzymes to break down all of the gluten and casein that we eat. And maybe enough of the first enzyme, not enough of the second enzyme, because it's the in-between stage of the protein where it is chemically an opiate. And so that's number one, incomplete breakdown from not enough enzymes. Number two condition, leaky gut. Um, you've probably heard of leaky gut, you may not have. It's also called increased gut permeability. And that means there are tiny, incredibly tiny holes um, that are actually bigger than they're supposed to be. And they let proteins through into your bloodstream. These partially broken down gluten casein proteins, which are still proteins. They're not meant to enter our bloodstream until they're completely broken down and then they're just amino acids. But the leaky gut allows those proteins into the bloodstream. That's condition number two. And in the blood, then from the blood, they can bind with opiate receptors um, in the body. There's a little bit of a gap in my knowledge there because I don't know if all opiate receptors are in the brain, but at least some are. I have a feeling that they're not all in the brain because opiates affect the gut as well. Um, but as I said, a little gap in my knowledge, but I did in my research, I have to shift positions, I'm getting pins and needles in my leg. Um. <laughs> Yeah, um, I did read that, yeah, the blood-brain barrier is also um, in, the, in the group that they studied that was affected by the opiates, it is also too permeable, letting things through that it shouldn't be. Um, as I said, the, the gut is supposed to have uh, a certain degree of permeability letting things through and that is to let nutrients through all the vitamins and minerals that we eat and 
everything that our body needs is meant to go through but those little tiny spaces become too big um, a third point on how does it happen it is a matter of degrees it's a matter of both of those things um, enzymes to break down the proteins and <laughs> what did I say next the gut permeability are both a matter of degrees so you can be affected by this to a greater or lesser extent depending on those things um, and including naturally how much you consume so that's the how it happens um, how does leaky gut happen good question if you're wondering that well done um, leaky gut happens for a variety of reasons the most interesting one I think is that eating wheat and milk products can actually so I'm not doing product placement for my Bible college um, <laughs> Bible college cup um, <laughs> distract myself not doing product placement and explaining that um, yes most interestingly wheat and dairy can contribute to the leaky gut issue um, but there are other factors that contribute to the leaky gut and kind of boils down to all the bad things in our diet and lifestyle will be contributing factors including toxins and including uh, processed foods um, and part of the issue is also the gut flora or if you've got an overgrowth of bad bugs they contribute to the problem too So, this is sadly common. Don't feel bad if I'm suggesting your gut is leaking. <laughs> it's not leaking anything terrible. But it needs some help and healing to do its job. Um, I've had this issue and I've had it tested. There is, I think I put that in my notes, you can test leaky gut. And I believe the test is by blood test and urine test and they compare the two. It's been a long time since I had that test. I've had it a couple times and my, I think when I had it done the first time it was pretty bad. Yeah but for me having anorexia was also part of the problem. Um, how do you know if you have this addiction issue to the yummiest foods in our diets, wheat and dairy products. When you think about it, um, basically is all the yummiest foods like, if I could eat them without consequences, I would definitely be having chocolate eclairs and cream buns and stuff like that. And normal pizza, we eat gluten-free pizza sometimes. So, how do you know? Um, the most clear cut way, like I said, there's a test for it. The test for, um, for this condition, the actual addiction condition, is I'm pretty sure just a urine test. And I had that years ago. Just quickly, if I can, the reason it showed only a small positive for me is I think at that point I wasn't at my worst. I hadn't actually been eating a lot of wheat and dairy and I didn't honestly want to eat a lot of wheat and dairy to try and get a better positive result in the test because I know the harm that it does to me so that's why at that time I had to actually send away to America for it but now it's it is done in Australia it's sure to be not all that affordable and I don't know if a normal doctor would know about it but um, it may be a certain natural health practitioner that, that would request the test. Yeah. But another way to know, aside from a test, is you can kind of do your own test, is try stopping and try having none. And that means a completely gluten-free, dairy-free, gluten-free, 
casein free diet for a minimum one week I would say I you would know within a week I would say you would get to day two or three or four or potentially not till day five or six and you would probably be feeling miserable and you would be craving wheat and dairy um, the honestly we're going to go through the symptoms of addiction and then symptoms of withdrawal and withdrawal really is not fun you can go to zero and test and see what your response is and you'll find out but it could be horrible and you would want to choose a good few days to do it don't choose it when you've got something important to do in the next two three days but most people are going to want to decrease slowly and and that is to reduce withdrawal symptoms because it's a nightmare but there's another strategy which I'll get to towards the end so um, yeah so symptoms of addiction and these are symptoms of any opiate use um, feelings of well-being that kind of goes with that saying like if you're watching this you probably know what I'm talking about about how you just really want some cheese or whatever and how you feel good afterwards um, feelings of well-being perhaps a degree of pain relief but in my experience the opiates from these foods are not strong enough for a much noticeable pain relief loss of appetite I definitely have noticed that um, maybe nausea maybe just a decrease in appetite not complete loss uh, drowsiness or feeling lightheaded confusion constipation for me that's one of the very obvious ones and a drop in blood pressure because this happened to me one time in hospital being treated in hospital for anorexia and I had a dose of casein protein milk protein and I had within a short space of time feeling so like fatigued um, wiped I was supposed to go out on day leave for a few hours but I was so wiped I had to just lie down in bed until until eased and in that time they did my blood pressure and they did see um, the low 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 blood pressure in the readings they did and the constipation after that was terrible really bad like I'm not going to tell you <laughs> so the loss of appetite I noticed in my son because he was about 10 at the time 10 11 and I would notice invariably he, he was mostly eating gluten-free dairy-free but I noticed when he didn't that um, he wouldn't be hungry for hours like say he had something wheat or dairy for lunch wouldn't be hungry till not hungry in the afternoon um, and I'm thinking I'm the mum I'm thinking I need to feed my child it's not good if he doesn't have an appetite I need to make sure he's uh, well fed not that you know not having an afternoon snack is not disastrous but we tend to be grazer types we um, rely on snacking for getting enough food in the day and um, and then maybe he wasn't even so keen for dinner and so I would point this out to him Cohen you might not think wheat affects you all that much but um, this is a sign to me that it is that loss of appetite and it's concerning if that's ongoing yeah you get undernourished kids this affects kids and adults even infants and some of the studies were on infants affected and they know that it reduces it causes slow growth reduces growth causes underweight children who are very fussy about eat um, 
Oh. I don't know if it's still recording, but my screen's gone. So, there we go. <laughs> Back to life. All right. We're getting towards, we're on the downhill. I think my husband's about to walk in the door. He's going to try and finish before he got home. But I was slow getting started. So, bear with me. You're doing well. I'm giving you a thorough um, overview of this whole thing. So, with the cold turkey approach to stopping, you know the phrase, cold turkey stopping 100% straight away. Um... You can do that, but um, if you get really bad withdrawal symptoms, then I would strongly suggest gradually reducing. Um, I think you would gradually reduce over one to three months. And then when you completely avoid, when you get to zero, I suggest, I strongly suggest you do zero for at least six weeks. No gluten, not even a crumb. No milk products um, or casein because casein as a protein, they sneak it into some other things. You would want to check labels um, and know which other grains have gluten as well as wheat. You want to do 100% as totally as best as you can for six weeks because it actually takes that long for all of those molecules to get out of your system because remember they've They've bound to opiate receptors. Takes time for them all to get out of the system. Hi, Rob. <laughs> Rob is not a dentist, but you won't see his face on the camera today. <laughs> and my son's home. So, symptoms of withdrawal. Summary version is it feels intolerable. Withdrawal feels like you cannot stand being in your own skin um, and you just feel like you really, really need whatever you love the most, cheese, whatever. But specifically, could be anxiety and panic, irritability or agitation, muscle aches or muscle cramps, perhaps insomnia, and then I think we get to the more extreme ones, which are more typically with heroin withdrawal or other strong opiates. Runny nose, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, sweating, and pain. So let me say again, this is not going to be as strong as someone who's using heroin. I think what I read was... Um, it's amount dependent, but typically, I don't know if my brain's making this up. Did I put it in my notes? Um, I think I read six times less. The effect from foods, perhaps on average six times less than, than actually using heroin as an injection, for instance. So... You're probably realizing this is a pretty big deal. And that's why I'm making this video um, because there are people I personally know that I um, am making this to help people that I know. I'll be uploading this, I'll be sending it ASAP to these friends. And it's tough sometimes, really tough to have to make such a big change to your diet. One of the friends I'm thinking of, I don't think he really even knows yet. I think he heard about the problem, but has not seriously considered that this is a problem for himself. And he might take some convincing. The other friend I'm thinking of, she is keen to like probably start today. So that's why I wanted to explain, make this practical. Um, you can start today, but you can't let yourself go hungry. Um, I'm not advocating fasting, starving, or anything like that. I want you to be well-nourished, well-fed, not getting low on energy. So it takes a bit of research to look into alternatives. I might try and make another video about how to do that again in the next few days. Or maybe it'll take me a couple of weeks to do that one. To give a bit of a guide, 
how to do it in a healthy way and also how to do it in a not all that expensive way because yes, the alternative foods as well as being usually not as nice are usually more expensive and you feel doubly ripped off i'm paying twice as much or three times as much for this loaf of bread and it's dreadful <laughs> so yeah you probably want to do some research how to do it plan ahead don't just dive in and then think what on earth can i eat now and just eat salad no so this doesn't have to be a nightmare it's going to be worth it and if you're a praying type i encourage you to pray i might be a nutrition coach but i like to say that the creator of the earth the god who knows you and your body better than anybody he is coach of coaches way better than me because he can guide you. Um, so pray and ask, is this something I need to consider for myself? How important is it for me to do it now? Because we can only handle so many challenges in life at once, so many problems and only so many changes at once. So ask if it's something for you to do now or later, how soon, in a week, or two, or ten, or six months time. You might be willing to start decreasing. So next question for prayer, how to do it. How to go about finding out for sure. Um, and then stopping. Um, gradually getting down to zero. But you will find out. And this is my this is my hope. Not that you will get sad at feeling like you have to have such a restricted diet. And this doesn't need to be entirely forever. If this is not in my notes, I hope it is, but um, you don't need to avoid them completely forever. There are actually safe and appropriate ways to have some and you can heal your gut you can nourish your body to produce more enzymes and you can find the healthiest options which include things like sourdough bread and soaking grains and there's a chance that A2 milk is better, but at least here in in Sydney, we can buy cold-pressed milk, that is A2, as well as cold-pressed. And I seem to tolerate that completely fine, which is encouraging. And then I'd be advocate for having ghee. Instead of butter, we use ghee, and we use it all the time for everything cooking, baking, toast. Ghee doesn't have the milk protein. If you were totally, if you were actually properly allergic to the milk protein, you probably couldn't have ghee either. But the, when it's an intolerance issue, then ghee is fabulous and I think incredibly important for us to get the healthy saturated fats. Yes, you heard that right. Healthy saturated fats plus the vitamin A. So. I'm going to have a sip of my drink, check my notes, give you a breather, thinking time, see if there's anything I've missed, and then we'll wrap up. All right, so one more thing. Two more things. Um, you're in the addictive process, like all addictions, you build up tolerance. And you need more to get the same results. So if you feel like you can't particularly control yourself with wheat or milk products, this is a really good clue. One way I see it is 
I th- and I think it's quite common, is people who love the flavoured milks and are having a lot of milk in the day. That I think they're loving the flavour, the chocolate, the caffeine, the sugar, and possibly also the opiate effect from the milk proteins. So it's a real problem. And being an addiction like anything else, this is to take blame away. And and there is a tolerance factor where you need more for the same effect. Bad but true. So, second point, if you are doing either a quick or slow reduction of these foods and you're getting withdrawal symptoms, this is an interesting way to test if it's definitely opiates. But this is a risky option. So I tell this to you with caution and urge you to use wisdom and prayer. But you can take something like a codeine tablet or a half. I would suggest you could start a half a codeine tablet. Codeine, you know, panadine, that's what it's called in Australia. Um, the pain relievers that have a low dose of opiates. I've used this for myself and I use this for my son. And it does help. And so it does two things. It will naturally ease withdrawal symptoms, if that's what's happening for you. And it will also demonstrate that it's an opiate issue. If you take an opiate, fixes your withdrawal symptoms, that's the problem. I used this for myself for a little while. I overdid it because I was in a bad place at the time, trying to solve my anorexia, which is by the way, just another addiction, um, another true actual addiction for anorexia. The addiction is to the opiate-like substances, the natural endorphins that our bodies produce when, um, when we drastically undereat. So that's not a suggestion either. <laughs> Don't start starving yourself for the high. But I tell you so you know it's also a real thing. If you want to know more about that, let me know and urge me to do a video really soon. But that's on my to-do list as well. So, trust me, I know the struggles with these things. And when I use it for my son, he had kind of done, poor, poor kid, he was again like 10 or 11 when... He was having a tough time and again I said look you really need to try having no wheat and dairy and see how much better you feel but no there's the withdrawal first of all so he was in such a state worst I've ever seen him um, you know kids can have their bad days and some kids can have meltdown type of reactions um, he was a bit depressed at the time, but he was so depressed and beside himself. Um, if you want to skip to the last minute of this, go ahead. But I'm going to really quickly tell the story because I have a feeling some people will be helped by this or at least amused. So we read about, I think, day four of him, No Weight, No Dairy, and he wasn't having a lot. But we went to McDonald's with friends after school just to hang out and I told him I'd warned him we'll be getting only gluten-free, dairy-free foods at McDonald's. And so he knew that was the plan. But we get there and we're choosing and you can have fries. The fries are, in Australia at least, are completely gluten-free. And you can have a drink. I think we were going to get a fruit frappe, that kind of a thing for him. So you're not terrible options, not just a salad. But he, he was just completely not coping. He was basically insisting on a burger or something and creating quite a scene in McDonald's, could not be calmed down. And 
I have a fairly good relationship with my son, who's now 18 and largely responsible for his own eating. And um, then I've lost my place again. Um, sip of water, dry mouth. I could take this tea strainer out. So, McDonald's. I don't know how else to capture the scene. Um, did I give in? I don't think so. I think he was like refusing to have the other options. And I think I said, we're going to have to go home. Yeah, no, I didn't give in. Um, I said, we're going to have to go home. On the way home in the car, which was only a 10 minute drive, he was venting, ranting, raving like never before, saying he stuff like hates his life he's the worst person ever wishes he was dead and that's pretty hard to hear from a 10 11 year old and I don't know if he was saying I was the worst mother in the world maybe that too but um we did two things that helped he will say that it's that he got to play computer games we went home and just let him go to his computer to play some computer games he says that's what helped and settled him down but I also gave him half a panadine, which is, I don't know how much codeine, tiny amount, relatively tiny amount. And he settled down. And I say it was, at least in part, I think mostly the codeine eased his withdrawal symptoms. So I didn't mean to experiment on my child, but um, it's really interesting to pay attention to these kinds of situations because you learn from them. So... I'm going to end with a word of encouragement for you. <sighs> Even if now is not the time for you to make changes to your diet, the start of change is considering it. If you're just considering if this is a problem for you, keep thinking about it. Keep paying attention to what happens when you do or don't have gluten and dairy foods. Um, you might be willing to do some further research and reading and if Google is not showing you any reports that confirm that this is a problem because I know that Google shapes the results it shows you there's a search engine called DuckDuckGo and DuckDuckGo does not filter results at all so I know I was using DuckDuckGo to search and found the positive and the negative about this. If you are starting to plan to change, good on you. Um, send me any questions and I'll do my best to help. And um, if you're ready to change, all the best. Let me encourage you. This is totally, absolutely worth finding out, at least if this is an issue for you. And then you're you're totally entitled to make your own decisions whether you want to um, stay zero um, look into how to heal your gut or you might just say look I'm going to moderate this problem um, and just limit it and that's a valid choice and maybe later on you'll be in a place where you want to go the 100% approach even if you do it gradually. So, good on you for watching. I encourage you to share this. Have a think about who you could share this with and keep your ears open for people who say, oh, I couldn't go without cheese. And if you're a brave type, then challenge them because they don't know how much better they could feel if they're free of this problem. So, <laughs> Bye for now um, and see you in the next video.